Hello, and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please excuse the voice, I'm just on the tail end of a cold I've waited as long as I can to record. Before we begin, please hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. It helps so much. You can also join my Patreon. We have a big goal there for fundraising and I will talk about that at the end of the video. It has been called Mormon Area 51 and it's also been called the Mormon Pyramids. Outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, headquarters for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly called the Mormon Church, is a very secretive location. It is known as the Granite Mountain Vault, and it sits up Little Cottonwood Canyon. This is one of the most secure and secretive locations in the world, and I'm betting most of you have never heard of it. It serves a very important purpose, one that many people benefit from and will benefit from in the future, not just Mormons, but this location has also become the source of lots of whisperings and conspiracies. As with all conspiracies, you will have to decide for yourself just how much of this story you believe to be fact and how much you believe to be fiction. This is the story of the Mormon's Granite Mountain Vault. I'm your host, Stacy Lee. Let's begin. The Mormon Church has undertaken a huge project, one that at the time many did not understand, family genealogy. Why? Family genealogy is one of the most important elements of Mormonism. If you're new here, I was born and raised a Utah Mormon. I was very active in the church until around 2008 when the church got involved in a political matter trying to stop the legalization of gay marriage. And as someone who understands the Constitution, I was very uncomfortable with this stance as marriage is a civil union and therefore governed as all civil matters are by the Constitution. I had always had questions about the church. I will tell this entire story if any of you are interested. But in 2008, I went, as they say in the ex-Mormon community, down the rabbit hole. And what I learned damn near killed me. By 2011, I was no longer attending church and I made the official request to have my name removed from church records in 2015. Again, I'm open to tell this whole story if you want to hear it. It's a lot, so just let me know in the comments. But whenever I talk about Mormonism, I feel it's only fair to let you in on a little of my history as my thoughts will surely be colored by my own experience. But the flip side of that is I have insight and information that most people do not have. And I think I can bring you a take that most cannot when discussing these matters. In Mormonism, you are taught that your lineage is your birthright, especially if you are born into the church. There is most definitely an element of, I know this sounds harsh, but superiority in the Mormon church. As you are taught that if you are born into a Mormon family, especially a Utah Mormon family, at least that's the way it was back in my day, you were preordained for this mission in life. There is very much an element of Mormonism about Mormons being the chosen people. Mormons believe that we all came from a place called the pre-existence before we were born, and that in the pre-existence you are chosen for this or for that, for this family or for that family, depending on your valiancy of spirit, your benevolence, your capacity for strength and goodness. Very intoxicating, right? Mormons are also taught that they come from one of the 10 tribes of Israel, and that also affects what family they are born into here on earth. The family you are born into here on earth has a history in Mormonism that predates this earthly existence. You have a heavenly lineage. You also, according to Mormonism, have a responsibility to, as they say, return with honor. You are expected to conduct your life here on earth in a way that will please your ancestors and that will allow your family to be reunited in heaven after this time on earth is over. Again, it is a wonderful concept and one that I would love some days to flip a switch and go back to believing in. There's a lot of peace in believing that all of those things are true, that you're going to see your loved ones again, that you're going to be reunited. It's very, very peaceful. So is drowning, they say. Just saying. So genealogy has become a huge part of the Mormon experience. But there is another, more controversial reason for the church's interest in genealogy, and that is what they call 
an endowment, a spiritual gift, and it's called baptism for the dead. Mormons believe that until you are baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you cannot be in the presence of God or of Jesus. According to Mormonism, no one who has ever died on this earth is currently in the presence of God or Jesus. According to Mormonism, every person who has ever lived and died on this earth is currently in purgatory, a holding place waiting for the second coming of Christ. They believe that after you die, your spirit goes to spirit prison, that's what it's called, and you wait there until Jesus returns to the earth after the apocalypse. After Jesus returns to the earth, the righteous will be reunited with their bodies of flesh. That's why Mormons don't believe in cremation, and that once you are reunited with your body of flesh and have undertaken the task of coming to this earth to gain that body of flesh, you are now like God. Mormons believe that God is a man of flesh and that in order to become like him, you must obtain a body of flesh and blood. So in this theology, because Jesus has not returned to the earth yet, no one has been reunited with their body of flesh and blood, and that means everyone is in spirit prison. But once Jesus does come back to the earth, what happens to all of the people who have never been baptized in the Mormon church? What if they were valiant and obedient Christians? Don't they deserve to be in the presence of God? Well, the Mormons have a fix for that. They baptize people posthumously. Now, before you get scared, they're not digging up anyone. <laughs> they're baptizing people by proxy. Who does this? Kids. When you turn 12 years old, you enter the Young Men and Young Women's program. There's an activity every week on a weeknight for those programs. And about every three months or so, that activity will be what's called baptisms for the dead. You meet with your ward, the people you go to church with, um, you're divided into wards by where you live geographically. You go to the nearest temple, the temples are the big white buildings that you can only go into if you have a temple recommend, and the kids are taken to a section of the temple that's set aside for baptisms of the dead. The kids are not allowed in the portion of the temple that adults go into. This is what the baptismal fonts look like. They are always placed below the ground to remind the saints of the grave. Joseph Smith described that the religious symbolism of the ordinance is to reunite the living with the dead, and part of that means all of the fonts are in the basement of the temples, underground to remind the living that they too will one day be buried underground. I do not know whether they continue to put the baptismal fonts in the ground in the more modern temples in the basement level. I have not been for years and years, but that is the theory, and all of the older temples have the baptismal fonts in the basement. The very first baptismal font, the Nauvoo Temple font, was made of a basin supported on the backs of 12 life-size oxen. It's a reference to the molten sea of King Solomon. The 12 oxen represent the 12 tribes of Israel. They're in a circle so that some of the oxen face north, some south, some east, and some west. The chairs you see above the font are for the witnesses. Mormons believe only in baptism by immersion, so during the baptisms, witnesses sit above to ensure that the proxy, the person being baptized, gets fully emerged in the water. We don't sprinkle water, you must be baptized by immersion like John the Baptist was baptized by Jesus. When I was a kid, I was a proxy for hundreds and hundreds of the dead, being baptized between 30 and 50 times per session. And I remember going at least 10, maybe 12 times. We had to drive to St. George, which is where I live now, from Cedar City, which is about 45 minutes north of here, because in Cedar back in the 80s, we did not have a temple there. There is a Cedar City temple now, but it's new. Here in St. George, where I live, stands the oldest Mormon temple. It was completed in 1877 and this is the temple I did baptisms for the dead in. It's the temple I was sealed in twice. Uh, sealed is what happens after you get married. And it's the temple that I did hundreds of sessions in. I had a group of really close friends in one ward and then in another ward, and we would go, gosh, every Tuesday? We would go for every Tuesday for years I went. So, I mean, I think I've been at least, at least, at least 150 times, maybe 200. This is a photo of the actual font I was baptized hundreds of times in. 
The person doing the baptizing is a temple worker. They read names from a list. The names have been submitted by relatives. These are people who have done their genealogy. Genealogy is very important. And they find the names of their relatives that were born before the Mormon church was, before the Mormon church started. So these people in the Mormon's eyes need baptizing. That's where the names come from. You stand in the baptismal font in your white jumpsuit and the man baptizing you stands in his. It's always a man, usually an older man, who's a volunteer in the temple. You plug your nose and keep your mouth closed and he holds his arm to the square. One hand goes behind your neck and the other one kind of goes on your abdomen and then he just dunks you over and over and over. Each time you come up, he says the name of the person that you're being baptized for, but it's very quick. You, you go down under the water, you come up, you take a breath, he says the name, you go down under the water, you come up, you take a breath. It goes very, very quickly. The most I ever did, I don't know why I remember this, was 112 baptisms in one session. Mormons believe that the people that they're being baptized for are in the room with them. Their spirits are there in the room watching and grateful that this ordinance is being performed on their behalf. It's a very important ordinance in Mormonism because you are assisting these ancestors and other people's ancestors without this ordinance of being baptized, they cannot ever be in the presence of God. So you are doing for them what they could not do on earth because they either didn't go to a temple or more likely because they were born before the founding of the Mormon church in 1830. So why is this ordinance of baptism for the dead controversial? I'm sure you've already figured out. What if someone who has passed on does not want to be baptized? Well, Mormons don't believe in that because they believe that once you die and you realize that Mormonism is the only true path back to God, of course you're gonna to wanna to be baptized. Many accusations have been leveled at the Mormon church that it is very arrogant to act for the dead, to assume that someone wants to be baptized. The church's response to that is that if people want to, I mean, again, why wouldn't they? Because you can't get into heaven without it. But if they want to in heaven, they can reject the ordinance. There's always an answer for everything to try to keep everybody happy. A lot of the controversy has come because the Mormon church has baptized all of the past presidents. It's baptized all of America's founding fathers. My friends, the Mormon church has actually posthumously baptized Hitler. And you can imagine the firestorm that caused when it got out. It was a very severe PR crisis in this area. The church has had a lot of those, but that one was really bad. The PR crisis even got worse when the Jewish community formally asked the Mormon church to stop baptizing Jews, people who do not even believe in Christianity. So yes, this is a controversial ordinance. And again, I can talk about more of this if you wanna hear it. That's a very basic description of the way Mormons view their family legacy. And so it comes as no surprise that the church and its members would be very interested in genealogy. Now, you all know I have my own issues with the Mormon church many issues, but it has done some good things. And the genealogy database is one of those things. In fact, I'm not so sure we'd be where we're at right now as far as genealogical databases are concerned without the efforts of the Mormon church, which date back decades before anyone else was interested in genealogy for things like DNA databases or reuniting with lost relatives. The Mormon church is a pioneering organization when it comes to genealogy, and it deserves the credit for the good that it has done in that realm. As the church leaders became more and more interested in genealogical work, it became apparent that this was a massive undertaking. This wasn't a new thing in the 1950s. In fact, the Mormons had been storing their genealogical records in an underground bunker since the 1800s. But the effort to create a huge genealogical database really took hold in the 1950s. The church leaders at the time became invested in preserving family records and making sure those ties were documented for time and all eternity. In 1958, the church began this major undertaking, boring into a solid granite stone mountain in the Salt Lake Valley. Blasting began in 1958 and continued for years. The first area to be bored out and constructed consists of two main areas. There's a large office space and a laboratory section of the vault. By 1963, excavation had been performed, forming a large tunnel reaching back 600 feet into the north side of the canyon. The office and the laboratory sit underneath an overhang of about 300 feet of granite. 
The office and the laboratory are in charge of all shipping and receiving, microfilm processing, and evaluating the received goods. And then there are, of course, administrative offices, things like that. The vault itself sits under 700 feet of stone, and it's situated farther back in the mountain behind the laboratory section. The vault consists of six chambers, which are each 190 feet long, 25 feet wide, and 25 feet high. Everything is accessed by one main entrance and two smaller passageways. Mosler doors, built especially for the vault and weighing 14 tons each, guard the main entrance. They are designed to withstand a nuclear explosion. Inside the six chambers are plenty of equipment to ensure that nature maintains the humidity and temperature levels optimum for storing microfilm. There are measures put in place to keep those same levels in the event of a climate crisis. Inside each chamber, there are banks of steel cabinets 10 feet high. The advancement of media, things like optical discs, which have a much greater storage capacity than microfilm, have made additions unnecessary, and the vault remains very much like it was in the 1960s. Now, what data is stored on all that microfilm and on all those discs? Currently, the Mormon Church claims to have the records of over 12 billion deceased people, some going back to the first century CE. It is actually incredible. The church uses data collectors on 220 teams spanning 45 countries, along with hundreds of thousands of volunteers to digitize paper records, photos, microfilm, and any other records they can find. By the year 2014, the Mormon church records were 32 times the size of the data recorded by the U.S. Library of Congress. There are about 2.5 million rolls of microfilm and 1 million microfiche. That equals around 3 billion pages of family history records. About 40,000 new microfilm rolls are added to the vault every year. And there are around 3.5 billion images on microfilm and digital media. Images of people from all over the world in different eras of time. It is a huge record of human existence. In 1999, the church began digitizing the genealogical microfilms stored in the vault and now keeps government records of births, deaths, marriages, wills, census reports, anything you can think of. This is why I always laugh at conspiracy people when they're like, TikTok is spying on you, or your phone is spying on you, or they worry about like giving their fingerprints or their blood. <laughs> Honey, you are already in so many systems. There is no privacy anymore. And you know what? If you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. None of us are that interesting, guys. We're not that special or that interesting that people are watching us all the time. If you think that you're being watched all the time, I mean, in all honesty, I would, you know, maybe talk to somebody. Also in the church vault, scriptures in every language, large leather-bound temple ordinance books that were hand-kept from the 1830s through the 1960s. So like everyone that ever attended the temple, they would mark it down, the date, the time, the session number, all of that stuff. There are materials and minutes from the general authorities of the Mormon church, financial records, even the backup tapes and audiovisual masters for all of the church movies like Johnny Lingo. <laughs> If you guys want me to talk about Mormonism, especially in the 70s and 80s, the church would put out these movies that are so offensive and so politically incorrect. Now, Johnny Lingo is the probably the worst one. It's about how a woman's worth is equal to that of cattle. <laughs> I so wish I was kidding. And the woman at the center of the story, her name is Mohana. <laughs> and everyone calls her, Mohana, you ugly. It's so bad. <laughs> Look it up. See if you can find it on YouTube. It's called Johnny Lingo. It's so bad. But the church keeps all of those kinds of records there. There's no public access to the Granite Mountain Records Vault. It's completely impenetrable with its own internal water reservoir. And like I said, doors strong enough to sustain any blast, including a nuclear one. Improvements made in the early 2000s guarantee a consistent temperature of 55 degrees and about 35% humidity. This vault is considered one of the most secure locations in the world. The church insists that the location is not meant to be secretive, just secure. They don't even allow the employees to wear jeans because of what they call blue jean dust. They're not allowed to walk through the halls in their everyday footwear either. Fibers on clothing become a big deal, and you can definitely see why they don't want large groups of people walking through the halls. 
There are lots and lots of very precious items and rare information stored in this Mormon mountain vault. But is that all that's stored there? Now, I won't go into too much of this today, but if you know anything about Mormonism, you know that the entire religion is based on one singular story, the story of the first vision. In the story of the first vision, I will say the official version of this story that the church teaches, Joseph Smith is a 14-year-old boy living in Manchester, New York in 1820. He goes to seek solitude in a grove of trees because he has questions about which church he should join. The official version states that Joseph Smith got down on his knees to pray, asking God which church to join, which was the true church. As he prayed, two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, appeared and spoke with 14-year-old Joseph, and they were God the Father and his son Jesus Christ. Again, we can talk more about this. Um, the story of the first vision and what I found out about it when I went down the rabbit hole is one of the main reasons that I left the church. That could be an episode on its own. There are, in fact, 12 recorded versions of the first vision by Joseph Smith. He told 12 different versions of it, and none are the official version that the church teaches. I can talk more about this if you're interested. But after Joseph sees God and Jesus, he spends the next four years being prepared spiritually for what is to come. And then in September of 1827, Joseph Smith goes to pray and an angel, the angel Moroni, appears to him and gives him a set of golden plates. On those ancient golden plates, as the story goes, is the record of what happened to Jesus Christ after Jesus was resurrected. The Book of Mormon is basically a sequel to the Bible, as Mormons believe it to be. Well, it's before the Bible and after Jesus' crucifixion. The Book of Mormon talks about Jesus coming to the Americas after he's resurrected, and it also says that's how the Native Americans ended up in North America. They were people that came with Jesus to North America. They're called Lamanites in the Book of Mormon except for DNA has now proven that this is untrue. Native Americans are descendant of Asia, not the Middle East. Again, part of my story, part of a lot of people's story as to why they leave the church. Anyway, Joseph is given this stack of golden plates. Now, no one saw the golden plates except Joseph. There were some men who said they did, but they later recanted. That's a whole story in itself. But Joseph described these golden plates as, six inches wide and eight inches long and not quite so thick as common tin. He said there were three rings running through the book holding the golden pages together and that it was about six inches in thickness. So there are some problems with that. Gold weighs 1,204 pounds per cubic foot. So using the dimensions given by Joseph Smith, the plates were about one sixth of a cubic foot. They would have weighed 200 pounds. In several stories, Joseph Smith tells of receiving the plates, taking them from the angel, and then he begins to walk home with the plates when he is attacked by a man who jumps out from a big log. This man knocks Joseph down by hitting him with a gun. Joseph gets up and runs for half a mile and is then knocked down again. Um, the story is to make you believe that wickedness was trying to stop Joseph from getting the plates to his house. But Joseph keeps getting up over and over, only to be knocked down over and over. And each time he fights off his attacker, gets up and runs home with these plates, these 200 pound plates that he has wrapped in a cloth under his arm as he runs like a deer and is attacked multiple times. Joseph Smith is really big into making himself out to be, you know, very courageous, very brave, very strong, very masculine. Also, Joseph Smith um, walked with a limp. That's a fact. He had surgery and it left him with an infection and he had to have more surgery for the infection. That left him with a very weak leg and a noticeable limp. So you get the gist. Now, what happened to these golden plates? Well, naturally, Joseph gave them back to the angel Moroni. That's the story. He translated what was on the pages and then he gave the plates back. But what if he didn't? What if he was told to say he had given them back but the church still has them. What if the golden plates are being kept inside the vaults in the Granite Mountain? Now, the golden plates are not the only important artifact in Mormonism, far from it, as Joseph Smith was obsessed with treasure hunting and had been arrested at least 42 times that have been documented. He was arrested and charged around 30 times with criminal actions in his lifetime, and he had more financial civil suits than that. Why? 
He claimed he was a water witch at times, that he could find water for people on their property and that would help them know where to dig their wells. He also claimed to be what is called a glass looker, someone who could tell people's fortunes and he would take their money for that. He claimed to have a special stone that would determine where hidden treasure laid in the bowels of the earth. He would take people's money for that as well. He also conspired to kill the governor of Missouri. You know, a little of this, a little of that. <laughs> But Joseph Smith's obsession with treasure and folk magic played a very big role in the development of his story about the founding of the church. Now, are you wondering how a 14-year-old American kid in the 1800s could read Reformed Egyptian on these golden plates? What, you didn't learn Reformed Egyptian in eighth grade? I mean, well, you see, along with the golden plates came this, a seer stone. Now, I'm going to preface this next part by saying, this is not what I was taught as a Mormon in the 1970s and 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s. The Mormon church secreted this information for quite some time, but with the advent of the internet, it has now come to light years ago. Joseph Smith claimed that the angel Moroni gave him a magical stone called a seer stone. Joseph, and only Joseph, would take the stone, place it in the bottom of a hat, put his face in the hat, which created a dark environment, and then the words from the golden plates written in Reformed Egyptian would glow in English on the seer stone. That is how Joseph Smith claims to have translated the golden plates. So as you see in this photo, a man named Oliver Cowdery, who was Joseph's closest compadre at the time, that goes on to be a whole thing later on, Oliver would sit and act as the scribe for Joseph. Joseph would sit with his face in the hat. The golden plates stayed under a cloth as Joseph was instructed not to allow anyone else to see them. And then the scribe would write down what Joseph spoke, watching the words that appeared on the seer stone. That's how he translated the book. Where is that seer stone? Could it be inside the vaults at the Granite Mountain Vault? There's another artifact. What I was taught, as far as the translation of the Golden Plates is concerned, is that this device was used to translate the Reformed Egyptian. This is called a Urim and Thummim. It is a folk magic tool used for revelation. The words Urim and Thummim mean lights and perfections. This instrument, the Urim and Thummim, is mentioned in the Bible in Isaiah and in Samuel as well. Depictions of this device appear in 2 Nephi in the Book of Mormon, and there are records where Joseph Smith claims to have used a Urim and Thummim along with the seer stone. But I was taught he used the Urim and, Urim and Thummim alone. The Urim and Thummim are these kind of spectacles looking item that come with a breastplate that you wear. And the two items work in Congress to decipher what you're reading somehow. Where is the Urim and Thummim? I would think something so precious and so important would have been kept very tightly held by the early Mormons. And even after Joseph Smith was killed in Carthage jail and the Mormons moved westward, someone would have taken hold of those items. Wouldn't you think so? So where are they? Now, I do need to mention the church split after Joseph's death. We would need a day for that episode alone. But even if the items ended up with people who split off into the splinter groups, Someone surely would have retrieved those items by any means necessary, you know? And as you know, the, uh, the Mormons are not above a little, a little murder and blood atonement when the Lord calls for it, if you know what I mean. So exactly what happened to all of those items? Many people believe that these precious and ancient artifacts are in fact being stored in the secret Mormon vault, bored into the side of a granite mountain in Salt Lake City, but that is just the tip of this iceberg. This object is called a Liahona, and it predates Christ. According to the Book of Mormon, prophets like Lehi, who lived around 600 BC, used this object for various purposes. It is described as a brass ball with two pointers that gave directions, physical directions like a compass, and spiritual directions like a paranormal guide. In the Book of Mormon, Lehi finds a Liahona while lost in the wilderness, and it points the way that Lehi and his family should go. When Lehi is obedient to God, the Liahona works. When he is not obedient, it does not work. Lehi then gives the Liahona to Benjamin, and Benjamin gives it to Mosiah. The Liahona is compared to the Word of Christ. It is a physical representation for the guidance and direction you get from living a chaste and virtuous life. This screenshot I took directly from the church website. It's an article from LDS Living published in 2018, and it says, quote, 
There are a handful of artifacts we read about in the scriptures that we know survive to our day because Joseph Smith and other early church members saw them. The gold plates, the Urim and Thummim with their accompanying breastplate, the sword of Laban and the Liahona. So that is directly from the Mormon church claiming that these items survive to modern day. Joseph Smith claims that he was given the Liahona by an angel, and there are no accounts of him claiming he returned the Liahona to the angel, as with the golden plates. So where is the Liahona? And of course, we have to talk about the sword of Laban. Laban is a character in the Book of Mormon. He is a wicked man who is killed with his own sword by Nephi when the Lord instructs Nephi to obtain the brass plates that Laban had possession of. And that story is very important in Book of Mormon lore because it's the kind of story where you're like splitting the baby. What are you willing to do for God? Are you willing to kill for God? That type of thing. And it becomes the story that leads to the Mormon doctrine of blood atonement. Well, I, I should say one of the stories. Well, Joseph Smith claims that he was given the sword of Laban in 1829. He writes that an angel appeared to him as he sat on a log in the sun and that the angel came and gave him the sword of Laban. There are no accounts of Joseph Smith giving it back to the angel. So where is the sword of Laban? Where is the Liahona? Where is the seer stone, the Urim and Thummim? Many Mormons believe that all of these artifacts, some of them dating before the time of Christ, are hidden away in the vaults of the Granite Mountain Vault. According to conspiracy theorists, the church publicly states there are three long tunnels inside the vault, but there is a problem that these conspiracy theorists see. When visitors were allowed inside the vault in 1963, they described three long, narrow corridors and four tunnels. The four tunnels are not in the official description. So what is all this extra space for? Why all the secrecy? And if you really want to get wild, hold on because this one's a doozy. In a page right out of Indiana Jones, there are those who believe that because the Mormon church is the one and only true church on this earth, that it is in possession of the most coveted religious relics known to man. I found articles stating that certain devout members are convinced that the Ark of the Covenant is housed in a secret bunker inside Granite Mountain. If you are unfamiliar, the Ark of the Covenant is the most sacred of religious relics, described as a large chest coated in pure gold that contains the tablets of the law written by God himself, the Ten Commandments delivered to Moses at Mount Sinai, and it also contains Aaron's rod, the walking stick used by Moses' brother. This rod later miraculously sprouts blossoms and almonds to confirm that God has chosen Aaron and his tribe for holy service. And the, the rod of Aaron is a big deal even in Judaism. Now in pop culture, the Ark of the Covenant is what Indiana Jones is searching for. And when it is found by the Yahtzees and opened, it melts their faces off. Remember that? Do you think it's possible that the LDS Church, the Mormon Church, is in fact in possession of these sacred ancient relics? Other relics found in modern times, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, are housed in museums and protected in historic churches. Don't you think that if the Mormon Church had these items, they would share them? Even beyond that, don't you think that with all of the discussion about these things not being real and the many members that are currently leaving the Mormon church, that if it had the golden plates or the Liahona or the Urim and Thummim, the sword of Laban, it would bring them out for all the world to see to prove that their doctrine is the truth? Or do you think it's perhaps too late that they would have difficulty in explaining why they've kept these things hidden for so long? Their answer to that is we shouldn't have to show you these things in order for you to believe in them. You should have faith. There's always an answer, guys, there's always an answer. Or do you believe, as I do, that none of these items except the rock, which was just a rock, ever existed at all? That the vault is, just as the church says it is, a place to house genealogical records and keep them safe even if the worst thing happens and we undergo a nuclear attack. And I'll leave you with a little cliffhanger. Does this vault, built into the side of solid granite, have anything to do with the fact that the Mormon church is buying up all available land in Florida. Yes, you heard that right. The Mormon church is now the largest private landowner in the state of Florida, and it owns 690,000 acres of land, including a 300,000 acre ranch that covers three counties. Why? We'll have to leave that discussion for another day. But what do you think about the controversy surrounding the secretive Mormon vault drilled into the side of a granite mountain? Is it just what they say it is, or are the conspiracy theories true?
Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. It helps so much. It's been really slow here in January and I could use a boost. You can also join my Patreon. That keeps the videos coming. And in the end, we have a big goal there. We're starting on that very soon. We would like to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that's never been tested because there's no money. There are thousands of sexual assault kits sitting in refrigeration that have never been tested. They cost between 500 and 750 bucks each. We would like to raise money, get some of those kits tested, and maybe solve a crime. The other thing that happens is we get that perpetrator's DNA in the system forever. And if they've committed other crimes, we might get hits on those as well. I want you to know how much I appreciate you stopping by and watching my videos. There are so many options for you guys to watch and a lot of good ones too. So the fact that you watch my channel, it, it means the world to me. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.